Hello and welcome again to the uh, second YouTube Christian message coming from Free School Court Evangelical Church Bridge End in South Wales. None of us knows, of course, how long the UK is going to be in lockdown on account of the COVID-19 virus. But God willing, as long as we're in this lockdown, we intend to send out on YouTube each Sunday uh, two Christian messages, one which will uh, go out on YouTube in the Sunday morning and the other of which will go out in the Sunday evening. We are, of course, living at a time of crisis, and not simply of national crisis. We're in a situation of world crisis as a result of the effects of this particular coronavirus. That being so, I want to speak this evening on what the Bible has to say about Christians living in a time of crisis. I want to do so, first of all, by reading some words from a letter which a man called Paul, known as the Apostle Paul, that means he was one of the uh, chosen representatives of Jesus Christ to transmit his message to the world, a letter which this man Paul wrote to a group of Christians who had been formed into a Christian church in the city, a major city in the Roman Empire, uh, called Philippi. That's in modern Turkey. And thus it's what's known as the letter to the Philippians. I'm going to read Paul's words, just a, a few sentences. After that, I'm going to pray, and then I shall launch straight into looking at what these words, which Paul wrote, have to say to us, what God's message is to us through those words, as we are living in a time of crisis. So let's hear what uh, Paul had to say. It's found in his letter, the letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 4 and verses 6 and 7. They read as follows. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'll pray briefly and then we shall look at those words I've just read. Let us all pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the great and the mighty God, the God who made the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them. We thank you, O Lord, that you have made us and have sustained us up until this point in time. Our lives, we acknowledge, are in your hands. And now, O Lord, as we draw near to you, we thank you for this wonderful book which you have given to us, the Bible. We thank you that it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. We acknowledge, O Lord, that left to ourselves we are in darkness. And the whole world is in darkness and we need the light of your word upon our pathway and we thank you that your word points us unfailingly and unerringly to the one who is the light of the world the lord jesus christ we thank you that he came to bring light into our darkened hearts and lives we thank you that he promised that because he is the light of the world, whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Grant to us then, O Lord, we pray, that light in life, that light in death, and that light for all eternity. Speak to us now from your holy word. Grant us understanding of what it says, and bless it to us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, these words which Paul wrote to uh, the Christians in the ancient city of Philippi are tremendous words, especially when we realise where Paul was when he wrote them. I'm sitting in 
the dining room to my house, the kitchen come dining room. I'm sitting in the comfort of this room, but when Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, he was in a very different situation. He was in prison. He tried to reconstruct what has happened. It seems that uh, it was as follows. He'd been treated very unjustly, very unfairly. He'd been kept in prison for some time, and as a result of the injustice of the way in which he was being treated, he, as a Roman citizen, was able to make an appeal to the emperor, to Caesar himself, and he had done that. And it seems at the time when he wrote this letter that he was really awaiting the outcome of that appeal, what would happen. It wasn't entirely certain. In fact, he makes it clear earlier in the letter that his life, in one sense, was in the balance. And he was quite open to the possibility that he might die. And so he wasn't writing from some ivory tower. He wasn't writing in a situation of great ease. You could say that he was writing this letter when he himself was in a time of great crisis himself. And there are three things in these words I want us to notice. He gives first a negative command. Secondly, he gives a positive command. And thirdly and finally, he announces a glorious promise. So let me briefly just take us through those three things that he says. First of all, then, a negative command. And the negative command is this. In nothing, be anxious. Something then for us not to do. We're not, he says, to be anxious. These, of course, are anxious times, aren't they? Some people are anxious about their health and about their lives if they catch COVID-19, especially, of course, if they have some serious underlying health problem. And although uh, the medical experts are telling us that the majority of healthy people who get this will have mild and not severe symptoms, we do know that already here in the UK and in other countries, some younger people in good health, as far as it seems, have had the COVID-19 and have died of it. So some people are concerned about their health, some are concerned about their, their lives. Others may have the concern not so much for themselves, but for their loved ones. Perhaps they have loved ones who are in the front line, in the health services, or working in the supermarkets and are concerned that they may pick it up. Maybe there are those who have loved ones who have serious underlying health concerns. So it's not so much then concern for one's own health and well-being, but concern for one's loved ones. And then on top of that, of course, there's the whole uncertainty with respect to jobs. How is this going to affect employment? It's one thing for governments, helpfully, to come with rescue packages, but for how long might that be sustainable? Might some people permanently lose their jobs? And depending on their age, may it then be almost impossible for them to get other employment. Some are very anxious about that. And then, of course, there's the effect upon the whole world economy. Not just one's personal uh, finances may, may take a hit, but the whole world economy with a knock-on effect that that might have. So these are anxious times, but God's word to God's people at a time such as this is, in nothing, be anxious. Let me apply that in a time of great concern on account of COVID-19, do not be anxious. And that is a command of God. The same God who said, do not steal. The same God who said, do not commit adultery. Who said, do not murder. Now says, do not be anxious. Now, I need to clarify what that command does not mean. Because it's possible, of course, to misunderstand what Paul is saying here. And it's possible to misunderstand it in one of two ways. Let me take them in turn. First of all, Paul is not saying that we should not have proper concern. 
He's not encouraging here a rather slapdash, careless approach to life. I couldn't care less, sort of thing. Well, there have been such people, haven't there? And, and it's really quite dangerous. People who've gone out and haven't kept their distance from others, and some of them have been interviewed on the news. Well, in effect, they say, I, I couldn't care less. He's not saying that. In fact, earlier in this letter to the Philippians, back in chapter 2 and verse 20, he's used the very same word. The word that's translated to be not anxious, he's, he's used that word earlier in a positive way. He commends one of his colleagues, a, a much younger man called Timothy, who had a great concern for people. And Paul is commending that. So yes, we are to have concerns for ourselves, right concerns. We have to have right concerns for other people. So he's not saying that we shouldn't have that right concern. What he means is this, it shouldn't take us over. It shouldn't possess us. If you like, he's saying, don't worry. I think we all know the difference, don't we, between a right concern about something. Think of someone who's preparing for an examination. A right concern means... He, he studies his books, she, she goes through it, she revises properly, and they, they take proper steps so that they can sit the examination and pass it. Of course, that's very different from somebody then who can't sleep at night and has butterflies endlessly in their stomach. How am I going to do in this exam? What's it going? That's the difference between a right concern and being anxious, worrying. But of course there's a second thing which Paul doesn't mean here and I think it's very important that I emphasise this and it's the following. Some people suffer from what can only be called high anxiety. You could almost say it's a kind of disorder. It's almost pathological. That they're anxious about anything and everything. And the great danger is of course that when such people hear this as a commandment for God, from God, then of course it increases their anxiety. And it increases their anxiety because they are now anxious that they can't obey this command of God. And they worry about that and that makes them feel even more guilty and thus they get into a terribly vicious circle of increasing anxiety. Well, God certainly did not intend in giving this commandment to increase the anxiety of such people. Thank God, you see, these words don't just say in nothing be anxious, but they go on and tell us what we are to do, how we are not to be anxious. And that leads on to the second point, the positive commandment. And the second commandment, the, the, the second thing Paul says here is that in everything we're to pray. In nothing be anxious, but, oh, that little word, but, how important it is. Here's the first command, the negative one. In nothing be anxious. How are we to obey that? Well, here it is, but, here's the great contrast, in everything. And in everything he tells us to pray. But, of course, it's not just any kind of praying. He breaks it up and he, he analyses the various elements of true prayer. So let's spend a little bit of time thinking about this. He says, but in everything by prayer, that word is a general word. It's a word that refers to speaking with God. And of course, that makes certain assumptions, doesn't it? And the assumptions are these. Truly to speak to God means that we realise he's our creator. We are his creatures. He's not on the same level as us. We've got to realise that. The Bible puts it elsewhere in these terms. He is in heaven and we are upon earth. He is great, we are little. He is the creator, we are the creature. And then secondly, he is holy or pure. There is nothing crooked in him at all. By contrast, sadly, that isn't true of us. The Bible puts it like this, that, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every time we come to God in prayer, we need to realise he is great, the creator, we are little, the creatures. He is pure, we are sinners. That's why throughout this letter, indeed throughout the Bible, uh, there's this great emphasis upon Jesus Christ. In the previous 
chapter to this letter, Paul has been speaking about the fact that though he once thought of himself as a very virtuous and a very good man, he'd come to realise that no, he was a sinner before God. And what he needed was to be put right with God on the basis of what Jesus had done for those who have sinned. He speaks about, as it were, having the righteousness, not of his own, but the righteousness of of Jesus Christ. That, that's our great need, the righteousness of God, being put right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. So there's the first thing then, this general word prayer. And then secondly, he says, but in everything by prayer and petition. Now that word petition refers to the fact that we are needy, a sense of need. People sometimes refer to someone and say, oh, he's a needy man, or oh, she's a needy woman. Ah, but the Bible says we're all needy people. You may live in a palatial residence, you may have a Rolls Royce, you may have it all made, but depend upon it, you're a needy person. And sometimes it takes a crisis like the COVID-19 to bring this home to people. You see, they've had plenty of money in the stock market. Ah, but the stock market has crashed. And they may have lost it. They've had a great job. Yes, but perhaps their job has gone. Oh, the supermarkets are always supply us with food. Oh, but, well, that could change, couldn't it? And it brings home to us that we're dependent upon God. And we've got to realise that. We, we can build a false security around ourselves. Job, house, money, the shops. You know, God can strip all of that away. He can strip it all away in a day. Indeed, he can reduce us. We're just lying on our backs, desperately struggling to breathe. We are needy people. And we need to realise that when we come to God in prayer, then we come with petitions. That is to say, we really realise we are needy. There's an old Christian hymn that puts it like this. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Saviour, I come to thee. So true prayer means not only that we realise that God is our great creator and we are his creatures, not only that he is holy and that we are sinners, not only therefore that we need Jesus Christ as our great Saviour, but now it means we realise that we are needy all the time. And then he adds a third element to true prayer. But, he says, in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Will you pardon a personal illustration? About three weeks ago today, I started to feel unwell, and then I was really in bed for two weeks. And only I had a nasty chest infection. And only about, about three days ago did I really begin to feel I was getting back to normal. Well, yesterday was my day off and I felt well enough, the weather being good, to go and to spend some hours working in the garden, clearing the gutters of the uh, conservatory to our house. And I felt so grateful to God, so thankful to God, that I had the health and strength to go out and enjoy the fresh air and work. But you see, I think I'd probably assumed my health. And it was only when I felt so unwell for those two weeks. Ah, now I was so thankful to God. But you know, we should be thankful all the time. You know, if I hadn't been on my back for those two weeks, I don't know if I would have felt as thankful. I may have thought, oh, well, I've got to do this job and uh, it has to be done. And I might have done it with an ill grace. But now, you see, because I'd been unwell for those two weeks, I was so glad. So glad to be alive, so glad to be well, so glad to have the health and strength. Beloved, we have so many things for which to be thankful to God. There's a great hymn that puts it like this. When all your mercies, O oh my soul, O oh my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view I'm lost in wonder, love and praise. Be thankful. Are you thankful to God? Do you give thanks for your food? Thankful for all the things he gives us. 
So he says, in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, and use the final element of prayer, make your requests known unto God. Present your requests to God. He, he knows them already. We don't have to make him known in the sense that unless we tell him, he doesn't know. What Paul means is God wants us to confide in him. He wants us to present these requests, to make them known to him, as it were, to unburden ourselves. And the word carries the idea of something very specific. So it means that we are honest with our anxieties, not now in a wrong way. There is a kind of praying where people simply turn in on their problems. They keep repeating them, repeating them, and it becomes a kind of mindless mantra. No, no, the, the Bible never views prayer in that way, but rather to be real with God. So if you're concerned about your health, about your life, about the health and life of a loved one, about your job, about money, about the future, be real. Be real with God. Don't, don't, don't think that you've got to put on a pretense before him. Thank God we don't have to do that. You can be honest with God and you come and you lay these things before him. You, you tell him, Lord, I, I'm troubled and, and I shouldn't be anxious. I should have a right concern. I shouldn't be anxious. Lord, I'm bringing it to you. Be real. Now that's real prayer. And remember, Paul was in prison. Paul was awaiting the outcome of this great appeal and yet evidently he's not at all anxious because he's practicing what he's writing to these people in nothing he's being anxious but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving he was making his requests known unto God and that leads on thirdly and finally to the great promise the negative command in nothing be anxious. The positive command, in all things, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God. And now thirdly and finally, a glorious promise. And, this is what follows from such praying, and the peace of God which transcends or surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. A peace of God, a peace not which we manufacture. I was speaking to a man last week on the telephone who's a delivery man. I said, you're obviously having to deliver a lot of food at the moment. And then he said to me, yes, you know, he said, and alcohol, a huge amount of it. He said, I fear that when all this is over, there'll be a huge problem of alcoholism and obesity in the land. He said there's a huge demand for alcohol. Well, the Christian way isn't to drown your sorrows. In fact, the whole tragedy of people who seek to deal with their sorrow uh, simply by drinking themselves uh, out of their sorrow is that alcohol is a depressant. Ask any chemist, ask any pharmacist that chemically alcohol is a depressant. No, no. The peace of God... This is something which comes from God himself and it surpasses all understanding, which means you can't account for it. I think of a woman I once knew, she was a very anxious sort of person, she was a Christian woman. She lived on her own and she had a heart attack. She didn't die, but I remember her saying afterwards, do you know I had such a great peace? I wasn't anxious at all. I thought I would have been. This peace that came to her from God, which surpassed all understanding. Well, says Paul, this peace will guard your hearts and your minds. And that word guard is a very strong word. It's the word that was used of soldiers who would guard a city, standing, uh, keeping guard. The, the city of Philippi it was a great Roman colony. And there would be many Roman soldiers linked with it. They could guard the city. Ah, says Paul, this peace of God will God, like a military man guarding a city, God will post his peace over your heart and mind. How important the two are. You see, our mind, we can um, reason things out and say, 
which is perfectly sensible, well, worrying will make no difference. Ah, but you see, you may say that, but your heart may still worry. In spite of what you are telling yourself, you still worry. Ah, says Paul, this peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. And then he adds, in or by Christ Jesus. Ah, he's writing to those, you see, who know Jesus Christ. You can't have this peace of God unless you've already got peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. But if you have this faith in Christ, you can then have this peace of God. Let me ask you as I close, do you know Jesus Christ? He came into the world to call people to himself. He didn't come for people who, think, who thought they'd arrived. He said, I haven't come to call the righteous, for a perfectly good reason. Nobody is righteous. But he said, I've come to call sinners to repentance. You may not have any Christian background. You, you may have had no interest in Christian things. But now you realise things aren't right between you and God. Well, Jesus Christ calls you to himself. He invites you to come and trust him. And when you trust him, then these words will be applicable to you. In nothing be anxious, but in all things, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. That's how to live in a time of crisis and a time of anxiety. May God bless you richly. May this be so for you. Goodbye.